Welcome back to ECE 220. We're in our final couple of days of material and really it's review material for the final and today we're focusing on chapter 9 material which is sinusoidal steady state and judging from what has happened in the past that actually represents half of your points on the final exam. So you'll have two parts to the final like you've done with all of your midterms and both parts, half of those parts, will be focused on sinusoidal steady state or chapter 9 material. So you definitely need to know chapter 9 material and that's what you are completing on Tuesday with homework number 15. That's your final homework submission and that's due Tuesday. Something else that will finish on the last day of class are teacher course evaluations, which I've kind of forgotten about to announce. The link is here, and I think you have been reminded multiple times in email. Is that true? Until you respond, you keep getting those emails, so I'm told. I don't see those results until way after your grades have been awarded or given. So be honest in your TCEs. It's not impacting your grade. And I need the feedback. I want to see what it is that worked, what needs improving, etc., relative to the teacher course evaluations. And I believe this year it's a new set of questions. I'm curious now how that will work, but now hopefully I've made you inquisitive and you will go and find out, oh, what's different this year with the TCEs? Fill it out. It's a deadline of Wednesday, the last day of class, and we will not be meeting in this classroom on Wednesday. Today and Tuesday we will have review for the final exam. Today we're focused on chapter 9 which is half of your points on the final exam. Questions on the strategy. So f make sure and complete homework 15. Submit the TCE and get ready for a lot of chapter 9 material on the final. Let me see if I can find the right pages. I'm actually set up, I hope. For this review. Again, this has two parts like you've seen in the past. This is available to you on the website. This is chapter 9 final exam practice and I think I've even gone ahead and made this set of questions available on our D2L website but you can also find it on Dr. Marcelin's exam site. But the first question is which of the following is the phaser representation for the function little v of t time domain expression capital V sub zero, amplitude, sine, frequency omega, time t, plus angle phi. What do you want to key in on first when asked that question? Or how could that be interpreted in an incorrect way to make you circle the wrong answer? They're now setting or telling you the time domain waveform as a sinusoid and we've agreed that all of our phaser representations will be in terms of cosines. So the very first thing we need to do is convert this to a cosine. And how do we do that? You could remember your picture. Here's the cosine axis and here's the positive sine axis. 
and see that the sine is 90 degrees behind the cosine. So we need to then take away or change phi in the argument or change the total argument of our cosine expression by taking away 90 degrees from that argument. And now we can start to put it into a phasor form. And what do we put as the angle? The magnitude is V sub 0. The angle, remember the omega t, that's assumed. We're assuming we are in a sinusoidal steady state. And I really can't emphasize that enough that when you're dealing with sinusoidal steady state, everything in the circuit is oscillating or moving at that frequency omega. Everything you see, currents and voltages, will be in steady state. And when do we reach steady state? We don't have to wait. We have to wait an infinite amount of time, which is five time constants, five tau. That's why it's actually fairly convenient to just say sinusoidal steady state, five tau. If tau is 100 milliseconds, five of those is half a second. You wait half a second and you're now in sinusoidal steady state. We don't need to worry about the omega t in the angle part. But now we need to convert that into the more formal way of writing the phaser, and that's to take out the symbol of angle and replace it with e to the j, the complex exponential. Or now we have v sub 0, e to the j, the angle. And hopefully then that corresponds to answer D. Second question. A sinusoidal voltage, and I'm just going to kind of race through these because that's, well, you'll have two hours for the final. And I don't remember. We'll have to look. I think the final is 12 questions. And six of those are on this material. A sinusoidal voltage has the form V of t is V naught cosine omega t plus 30. Which of the following diagrams closely represent one cycle of this waveform? I sometimes like to just remind myself what's a cosine look like not shifted. We now have a shift of 30 degrees. Unshifted, it would look something like that. It starts at its maximum at 0, time 0. And so if we wanted to continue it, which it looks like that's how they've done it, and they've, st oh man, I did mine in one continuous motion. So they're giving us something like that piece of the sine wave or of the cosine wave, but now it's shifted in time. This is with phi equal to zero degrees. And now they have phi equal to 30 degrees. Which direction and the other thing that you can sort of keep track of is this cycle occurs over 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians. This particular point would be 90 degrees. This one would be 180 degrees. This would be 270 degrees, and that point would be 360 degrees. Now we kind of want to say, OK, which way am I shifting this maximum value when I have a phi of 30 degrees? And that 30 degrees is positive. You now say, oh, if I now have a positive angle in my argument, the time that that argument becomes 0, now you're sort of saying, oh, from this 
I'm saying omega t plus 30 degrees. When is that zero? That's going to be when t is negative. So you've now, you now want to shift left the peak. when phi is greater than zero. And how much do we want to shift it? Just 30 degrees, 30 percent, oh, I'm sorry, one third of where 90 would be. So if we shifted it left 90, that first minimum would be what, where we would be at at time t equals zero. Is that and where's the maximum? It's to the left of zero. So now which ones could we rule out right away? We could say, oh, it's not A because the maximum and it's not B because those two have our maximum to the right of T equals zero. It's either C or D and which one sort of gets us one-third of the way to that minimum, C or D? D kind of gets a 60, or at 60 degrees, C is now our answer. Is that? Pardon? How do we know we're moving to the left with our peak? I now focused on the fact that the peak occurs when the argument is equal to zero. I set the argument equal to zero and that tells me, oh, omega t plus 30, I solve for t and I end up with t is equal to minus 30 over omega. That tells me I'm going into the negative time portion of my time axis. Question three, in an ideal inductor under sinusoidal steady state conditions, which of the following describes the relation between the voltage and current sinusoidal functions? How would we maybe approach that? I'm smiling. I know you can hear that smile, right? On the audio if you're listening. You know what I'm smiling about, right? Eli, but how do we translate that into the sinusoidal steady state? Ohm's law tells us, or we could just say Ohm's law, and we now know that V sub L, the voltage of our inductor, is the impedance of the inductor times the current of the inductor. We can always rely on Ohm's law. What you do have to remember is what the impedance of an inductor looks like as a f when you're in sinusoidal steady state. It's now an energy storage device. It does depend on frequency. And what's the expression for the impedance of an inductor? You need to remember that and the impedance of a capacitor. What's the impedance of a resistor? Z sub R is just R. That doesn't depend on omega, right? So the impedance of a resistor is frequency independent. The frequency or the impedance of an inductor, we derived that, and it's J omega L. The impedance of a capacitor, which is not needed for this problem, but it could be for subsequent problems or problem similar to this is 1 over j omega c. If we now plug in j omega l into Ohm's law, we see that the phasor voltage is j omega l phasor current. 
and we could write that. How do, where is J? If we go stand on J, I'm making a big deal of this, but you know now how to stand on J. If you're in the complex plane, where do you go to stand on J? Up, 90 degrees, right on the vertical. What's the angle then associated with J omega L? Does that help us then answer this question? You give me a phase on the current, the current angle, and now what's the voltage angle relative to that current's phase? It's 90 degrees more, isn't it? So how can we interpret that? It's plus 90 degrees. The voltage now leads the current by 90 degrees. Because if this was our angle of our current phaser, then the voltage phaser is now, or its angle, And that's now counterclockwise. That's now in front of, why did I say theta sub L? I wanted to say theta sub I. That's the angle of the current, theta sub I. So that's now in front of whatever theta sub I was. Let's say this is now our current phaser. Now our voltage phaser is 90 degrees ahead of that. It leads I sub L, the current phaser, by 90 degrees and leads as all its the angles are always measured positive with respect to the positive real axis. That's how we're measuring angles. Our angle now is measured relative to that positive real line. And this we could say is our theta sub i. Page two. Oh, are you kidding me? Oh well, I'm just gonna live with it. Spent a lot of time trying to adjust the scaling, but this looks funny in scale, but I'm just going to live with it. Now we want to know, in the ideal transformer shown, what are the polarities of the voltage ratio and the current ratio? Those polarities on our turns ratios can be plus or negative, positive or negative. And how do we infer that information? Or how do we determine that information? What do we need for the turns ratio on our voltages to be positive? What do we need to know about? And it all depends on the dots. How are the dots and the polarity labels of those dots, what produces a positive turns ratio for voltage. And in this case, well, let's just talk it through. How are the voltages labeled relative to the dots? Are the po positive labels both on the dots? for V1 and V2. V1 has positive on the dot. V2 has a negative on the dot. So our labels of voltage are not consistent with the dots in terms of our positive labeling of voltage is not both on each dot. I'm probably saying that. So here let me just say the voltage, I knew that was going to 
give me a huge oh well how did I say state this voltage polarities are not the same with respect to the dots what does that imply that implies that we need to introduce a negative in our turns ratio what about the currents are the currents and now we need the currents to be just the reverse of the voltages we want our currents one to enter a dot and one to exit a dot to give us a positive turns ratio what do we have here I1 does what to its dot it enters the dot before it goes through the coil so I'm gonna say I1 enters and I2 what does it do it likewise enters that says it too needs to have a negative sign to have a positive sign for the currents we need one to enter and one to leave now we're looking for voltage ratio is negative current ratio is negative D number five what is the impedance seen by the current source so we're now asking what kind of an impedance do we see there and now we have this ideal transformer and what does that ideal transformer do to our impedance now we're looking in a mirror it reflects a certain impedance that transformer changes the look of that Z sub 2 if our transformer transformer coils had the same number of turns then Z2 would look like Z2 on both the primary and the secondary but it doesn't do that if we have turns that are different what's our turns ratio here and I like to just label this so that I don't confuse myself n1 one is primary two is secondary n1 colon n2 our alpha our turns ratio is two we actually will see then if I can redraw this here's Zn here's Z1 and this is the reflected impedance of our load how do we find the reflected impedance on the primary side of that transformer it's related to the Z sub 2 through the turns ratio of Z sub 2 over alpha squared and in our case that now says that Z sub R is Z sub 2 over 4 and what then is Z sub R well it's I'm sorry what is Z sub N Z sub N 
is now Z1 in parallel with Z sub R. Do I need to continue? So now if you can just do the parallel combination of Z1 with Z sub R and you now know what Z sub R is, it's Z2 over 4, now the impedance seen by the current source Zn is now Z1 times Z2 over 4 over Z1 plus Z2 over 4. Can I get any more messy? So I tried to spend yesterday trying to size all of this and now it comes up the wrong size. But if you multiply top and bottom by 4 or multiply by 1, you'll end up with Z1, Z2 over 4Z1 plus Z2 or C. That's now the impedance seen by the current source. A voltage, problem six, a voltage 10 cosine of 1000 T plus 30 degrees is applied across a parallel combination of a 100 ohm resistor and a 10 microfarad capacitor. What is the impedance of the two element parallel combination? This is kind of a repeat of problem five in a way, but now you have to be working with what do these different impedances look like? What is Z sub R? Resistor doesn't depend on current and we just said that that's a hundred. And we're trying to now find Z, let's say effective, is now Z sub R in parallel with Z sub C. That's all we're asked to do is compute the parallel combination of a resistor's impedance and a capacitor's impedance. And we know the resistor's impedance is 100. What's the impedance of a capacitor? That's 1 over J omega C and that's the only reason we were told what the voltage was is to give us our omega. The omega now is a thousand. So that this is now one over J a thousand and it's ten times ten to the minus six. And that J in the basement becomes a minus J if we take it upstairs by multiplying by J over J. We now have minus J and downstairs we have 10 to the fourth times 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 2. Our Z sub C then is minus J 100. And now what we need to do is find Z effective which is ZR times Z sub C over their sum. Z sub R plus Z sub C. And now you can do this however you want. Plug it into your calculator, numerically figure it out. We have upstairs a minus 90 and we have 10 to the fourth. Just multiplying 100 times 100, 100 squared is 10 to the fourth, minus j is minus 90. What's downstairs? Well this is now, if you wanted to draw that denominator, it's now 100 here and then it's minus J100 here, so the denominator is that. 
which is the hypotenuse of a right triangle with equal sides. This is now of length 100 over or 100 times the square root of 2. And what's its angle? I go over 100 and down 100. I go over the same length as I go down. That's 45, and it's down, so it's minus 45. I now have 100 over the square root of 2. And what do I have for an angle? I subtract the angle that's in the denominator, and it was minus 45. I now have is my angle in phasor form? No, I have to now put this into rectangular form. And this is now cosine of minus 45 degrees plus j sine of minus 45 degrees. And the cosine, so I now have 100 over the square root of 2. Cosine of minus 45. You're wondering why I'm carrying through all the square roots of 2. But that's now 0 0.707, or the square root of 2 over 2. And the sine of minus 45 is minus j square root of 2 over 2. The square root of 2's cancel. I have 100 divided by 2. Or that's now 50 minus j50, which is one of our answers, d. Page 3. The voltage source, V of t, is 10 cosine of 1,000. What is the expression for the sinusoidal steady state current? Again, you need to get very comfortable with impedances of these three circuit elements, resistors, inductors, and capacitors. This is R plus j omega l plus 1 over j omega c. That's the total. That Those are all three in series, and I just need to sum up their impedances. And realize that I have an omega of 1,000 that I need to incorporate into my expressions or formulas. I now have 100 for R. Or if I'm doing it with exponents, let me say 10 to the minus 1 plus 1 over J. And this is now 5 times 10 to the minus 6. Or that is now 5 times 10 to the minus 3. And it's going to have a negative associated with it. I have 100 here plus J100. And the J is downstairs, so that's a minus J. And I now have 1,000 divided by 5, or 200. So that my total impedance is 100 minus J100. And that, again, if I wanted it in polar form, is the hypotenuse is a square root of 2 bigger because I have equal sides. And my angle, I'm now going down, is minus 45. 
that's supposed to be helpful. V as a phasor is now 10 at what angle? It's in cosine. They've given us luckily in cosine. Somebody could give it to you in sine. You would need to subtract off a of 90, but this is now 0 degrees. Now in phasor terms, which we're using because we're in sinusoidal steady state, we have the voltage phasor divided by the total impedance. This is now 10 at 0 degrees divided by 100 square root of 2 at minus 45 degrees. Or I can cancel one of the 10s and I now have 0 0.707 and what's my angle? I subtract a minus 45, I now end up with 45 degrees. Or this now as a phasor And what does that translate into for I of T? The magnitude it's all shaking at the same frequency which was a thousand and now the current relative to the voltage which was at zero is now at plus 45 and hopefully that's one of our answers. Answer A. Part 2. With only the current source, I s do you want me to now kind of talk my way through these and not work them out so much? give you maybe the process so that we can get through more. With only the source I sub S present, the coil current is found to be 10 cosine omega T. Fine, and we have two sources. We have I sub S and we have source 2. So let me call this I1. Well, no, I'm not going to call that I1 because I'm calling this I1. So now I is really going to be made up of two pieces. It's an I1 piece and an I sub 2 piece. Where I1 is due to source 1 and I sub 2 is due to source 2. This is the source, I'm sorry, this is I due to source 1. And what is that? That's 10 at an angle of minus 28.1 degrees. What's I sub 2? Well, this is now, I'm going to call this I sub 2 as a phasor, and that's going to be when I just have source 2 present and source 1 is 0. How do I zero a current source? I open it up so that now I have this inductor, resistor, and capacitor. And here's my second source, which was 10 at 90 degrees. And I'm looking to find I sub 2, where this was J2 this was 4 and this is minus J. How do I find I2? Here's I2 and here's some I sub X. And I know those two sum 
have to sum to be 10 at 90 degrees, or I could do a current divider. I can now say that I2 via a current divider is minus J over the sum of all of those impedances times the source. And obviously I have to be conversant in complex math. And finally my total I is going to be in phasor form I1 plus I2. I was given I1 in the time domain. I converted it to a phasor. I can now compute I2 as a phasor. Probably want to put those into rectangular form as complex numbers, add them up, end up with a phasor I bar, put that back into the time domain. And you may want to sort of sketch what I1 and I2 look like as a phasor. And then you can combine those graphically to figure out what's my ballpark value. And in fact, it ends up being B. The frequency response. What in the world? We haven't talked about frequency response, but it's really not that big of a deal. But rather than spend time, let's go on. I, this one, if we want to do it, we just need, so the frequency response is V out as a function of J omega over V in as a function of J omega. So you need an equation that contains only V out and V in and then find their ratio. And you can do that by writing a KCL equation in impedance form at node A. You'll have the current going down in both of those impedances, V out over R2, V out over J omega L, plus V out minus V in divided by R1. Boom, you're done. Solve that for V out over V in. Let's do 10. Problem 10. It's very similar. The current I, which we can now, we're in sinusoidal steady state, we can now say this is 0 0.1 at an angle of 0 degrees, and omega is now 1,000. Find the sinusoidal steady state voltage which is all of those are in parallel. If I can now write one KCL equation at this node A, I will have a relationship between V and I as phasors. Current in, I as a phasor is equal to V over R plus V over J omega L plus V, and these are all phasors, over 1 over J omega C. Solve for V. You know what I is. I is 0 0.1 at zero degrees, so that's just 0 0.1. Solve for V and you have your answer. We'll come back to that if we have time. But it's essentially all set up. Let's do this one. 11. The phasor voltage V sub S is 100. 
and it's real. It's at an angle of zero. What is the value of the phasor current I sub 2? Well, now you probably want to just start putting in some labels. Let's say this is now my primary current phasor, I1. And let's just say this is now V1 and this is now V2. Because I have a ideal transformer. And now I can relate I1 and I2 and V1 and V2 via or because of this ideal transformer. What do I know about my eyes? Are the dots opposite or are they the same? What does that then imply about my relationship for currents and turns? I know my amp turns are equal. So I1 N1 is equal to I2 N2 and what's the sign? These are kind of tricky. The currents having opposite dot relationships give us a positive turns ratio relationship. So this is the correct way. We don't have to negate a sign in that turns relationship. What about the voltages? The voltages I labeled those to be the same. That now says I also have a positive sign in my turns ratio relationship. This is now V1 over N1. My volts per turns are equal on both sides. And this now allows me to solve for one in terms of the other. I1 is now 2I2. Two and V1 is 1 half V2. If I now have I1 and I, I'm sorry, I1 and V1 floating around in my equations, because how many meshes do I have? I now have mesh analysis going on. I have two meshes. I'm going to have I1s, V1s, I2s, V2s floating around. I can get rid of I1 and V1 because of this ideal transformer relationship. But let me now just write initially KVL around the first mesh here. Do you see that that's minus Vs plus 10 I1 plus V1. I don't need to worry about anything with that coil because it's an ideal transformer. I just need to say, oh, that's plus V1 for my drop. And now what's my final drop in mesh 1? 10 times I1 minus I2 because I2 is over there. This was now minus V sub S plus 10 I1 plus V1 plus 10 I1 minus I2 equaling 0. What about KVL at 2? In mesh 2, I have 10 times. Now I'm going clockwise in the second mesh. It's 10 times I2 minus I1 minus V2 plus 20 I2 equals 0.
and you can now get rid of the I1s, the I2s, I'm sorry, the I1 and the V1 from these equations. And now you have two equations in two unknowns you can solve for I2. And you'll end up with that. One more in 30 seconds. The voltage source, V sub S. And now we need to rewrite V sub S, the current I, and the voltage of our capacitor as phasors. What's V sub S as a phasor? Do you see that? Because we started with a sign, it was given to us as a sign. This is now 10 cosine, oh my, I have no idea what I just touched. But this is 10 cosine of T minus 90 degrees. So that already tells us that those are the only two possibilities. If we can now figure out what I is, we could probably deduce between A and B, or A and D. I as a phasor is V sub S over the total impedance, which is 3 plus 1 over J, and our frequency was 1, and this is 1 fourth. So that was minus 90, and this actually ends up being 5 at minus 53.13 degrees. Do you see that we now have minus 90 plus 53? It's going to be a little negative for I. So it's actually that one. I is not positive. So it's A. That was very fast but I think I've given you enough to start and I apologize I went over but we'll pick up with more review tomorrow.